I received word about a week back that my professor, E.K. Brown, had passed away. And for a generation of seminary students at Boston University, we learned church history from Dr. Brown in first-person narrative. He would take on all the different characters of history and they spoke to us. And so in his honor, I'm going to try to do the same for a good part of the sermon for you. Most of you probably think I'm Irish, but you'd be wrong. Let me tell you my story. Yeah, I was born in 489, the then known world was ostensibly Christian. Well, it had been since the time of Constantine. Near the edge of the Roman Empire, somewhere in the northeastern part of England, there lived a Roman Britain family. My name was Patricus, but the local folks called me Patrick. I was born into an aristocratic Christian family, and although my grandfather was a priest, my folks didn't go to church much. As a teenager, I must confess I was a bit of a rebel ridiculed the uh, local clergy, lived on the wild side of alienation and ungoverned living. Some would say I was a lot like the teenagers of your time. Well, some time during my 16th year, a band of Celtic pirates sailed from Ireland and conducted raids on our part of England. Well, the Irish were famous for plying the, the slave trade. And in these raids, they capture foreign peoples and bring them back to serve their chieftains. I was captured during one of these raids and taken against my will far away from home. Once in Ireland, I was sold to a tribal chieftain, a, a druid named Milluk, and he promptly forced me to herd cattle in the hills. It was lonely and dangerous work. I was given little food or clothing, constantly exposed to the elements of those wind-swept places. These circumstances gave me a lot of time for thought and eventually prayer. After I reached Ireland, I, I used to pasture the flocks each day, and I used to pray many times a day. More and more did the love of God and my fear of him and faith increase, and my spirit was moved so that in a day I said anywhere from one to a hundred prayers, and in the night a number likewise. And besides, I used to stay out in the forest and on the mountains, and I, I woke up before daylight, to pray in the snow, in the cold wilderness, in rain, and I used to feel neither ill nor any slothfulness, as I now see the Spirit was burning in me at this time. It was then that I began to identify the presence of the triune God that I'd learned about as a child. Without any outside help, I was becoming a devoted Christian. 
and even my captors began to notice a change in me. Well, at the same time, another change was happening. I began to identify with the very people who had enslaved me. I learned their language and culture, understood their view of the world and their religion. In time, believe it or not, I became, began to love them as people who might one day turn to the triune God. In a very real sense, having grown up, Oh, growing up with the privileges of a Roman insider, I came to identify with the, the outcasts, began to see them as humans and not the barbarians that most Romans considered people outside the empire to be. Still, I was a slave and I sought my freedom. After six years in captivity, a vision came one night, a dream where a voice spoke to me. You're going home. Look, your ship is ready. I woke the next morning and I began walking 200 miles to the seacoast. and negotiated my way on board a ship bound for Gaul. Well, you can call it France nowadays. And eventually made my way back to England. Shortly after rejoining my family, another vision came. In this dream, a man named Victoricus came to me with letters from our former captors in Ireland. I read the beginning of the letter, the voice of Irish, and as I was reading the beginning of the letter, it seemed as if that moment to hear the voice of those who are beside the forest of Foucault, each near, near the Western Sea, and, and, and they were crying as if they were one voice. We beg you, holy youth, that you shall come and shall walk among us again. Awakening from the dream, I knew this was a Macedonian call, much like the Apostle Paul experienced. I was being called to go back, walk among the very people who had enslaved me. It was my turn to be the captor capturing those people with the good news of Jesus Christ. I studied for the priesthood in France, got permission to go back to Ireland despite all so many protests from my family and some church superiors. All oh, the tasks that lay ahead, it was a difficult one. After all, it had been over 200 years since there had been a successful organized Christian mission outside the boundaries of the Roman Empire. The church assumed that barbarians were impossible to reach, for they were neither literate nor intelligent enough to understand Christianity, let alone to have the capacity to become civilized after they did understand. 
places like Ireland were isolated from the Roman Empire and church officials knew little about the people. Well, other than they weren't Roman. They were fierce in battle, known to practice human sacrifice and, oh, would carry the heads uh, of their defeated on their belts in battle. Boy, that was a tough crowd, to say the least. But while the Roman church knew little about the Irish Celts, I knew them, knew them well. Having survived that violent and superstitious culture, I knew the common language and had a soul burning with the desire to bring these people a new hope and a new future. I adapted a radically different approach from the usual Roman Catholic plan. Rather than set up a church at the center of a parish and then try to get the people to come, I and my entourage engaged in a relational strategy. We met them where they were. We didn't try to Romanize them, teach them Latin before telling them about Jesus. Arriving at a tribal settlement, we would engage the chieftain in a conversation, hoping that conversation would go on or at least get permission to camp nearby, and the team would meet with people, engage them in conversation, and look for those who were receptive. Uh, we would pray for the sick, counsel those who needed it, and mediate conflicts, one time I even blessed a river and prayed the people would catch more fish. But all that bit about the snakes, well, that's just a story. In this way, we made sacred the mundane. As I had found God revealed in the plainest of circumstances, so we share God the same way. We regarded, we engaged him in open-air speaking, using stories and parables to engage the Celtic imagination in their connection with nature. For example, when I wanted to talk about the triune God, I pluck a three-leaf clover and use it to describe how God is one and three all at the same time. It was my custom to encourage the people to ask questions to express their hopes and fears. After a while, a community of faith would grow up and we'd go on, we'd leave a priest behind to, to nourish the fledgling community. And you know, over the years, about 700 churches and monastic communities were planted this way. As Paul once answered the call to go to Macedonia to bring Christ to the Roman Empire, I shared Christ with Ireland. And even though I'm not Irish, and really not Catholic or Protestant either, You know, St. Patrick's left quite a, a legacy in his ministry in Ireland, a nearly complete transformation 
By the end of Patrick's life, or shortly thereafter, the slave trade had completely disappeared from Ireland. Maybe he did drive out some snakes after all. The previous illiterate Irish soon became people who, according to Thomas Cahill, saved civilization by hand copying the classic works of Europe that may have been lost forever during the Dark Ages of Europe. Irish missionaries began to move out to places like Scotland and converted the Picts to Christianity following the same methods as Patrick. So, it's St. Patrick's Day. We might celebrate by wearing green. It's so good to see the choir wearing so much green. But maybe we could do more by being a little bit more like Patrick. We celebrate someone who was willing to use tragic, unfair circumstances in his life as a springboard to make a difference to the lives of the very people who had enslaved him. Rather than run away from conflict and opposition, Patrick moved towards it. Rather than to buy into fear and say, oh, well, they're just a lost cause. No, he instead grew to love the outsiders and gave his life over to them. His tenacity, dedication to gracious hospitality, and devotion to Christ serves as a model for all of us who call ourselves Christians. Be a voice of love in a world where there is far too much hatred. So what are you going to do to honor St. Patrick's today? Maybe the best way that we can do it is to offer some holy conversation to a person who needs it. Engage that person at work who may be difficult for you. Offer some help to a neighbor without even being asked. Drop a note to someone who could use some encouragement and begin by connecting with somebody who you might think is a them, someone that you don't know. Amen. Well, we've looked at Paul.